These songs have been lost for decades, no one knows who made them, and it's driving everyone insane. Can you find them? In a time where we can see almost anything we want almost instantly, the idea that something is just not available for us to see sort of drives us nuts. And that eerie, frustrating feeling of something just being gone is why there's so many people that look for lost media, no matter how obscure or strange that media may be. When we think of this type of media, we usually think of lost TV shows, movies, or even even video games, but rarely does the idea of lost music come up, which is a shame because for most of us, music is a daily and important part of our lives. And yet, there are countless songs out there that are partially or fully lost, with little information of even when or where they came from. They're just forgotten works and tracks that have been lost to the sands of time, and only that time will tell if anyone will ever hear them again. Today. We're going to cover five of these lost songs. Moreover, I've chosen these songs based on the interesting stories behind them because I think half the fun with finding lost media is the journey people took to find what they're looking for, and that deserves to be told. I'm Hector Holtz, and I do investigative work on internet mysteries. Join me as we shine a light on the obscure and unheard, attempting to unravel their tales. This is the internet's most interesting Sting, Lost Song Searches. We'll start with the strangest source I have ever seen for lost media. On November 2007, user Kion on the website Oh The Lyrics would upload the first snippet of what would later become known as How Long Will It Take? This was the sample provided. This initial post by Kion though wouldn't attract much attention and quickly hit a dead end. On November 2010, someone else posted a different snippet of the song, indicating how long will it take had been at least distributed in some way. Again though, this clip also attracted little attention and faded into obscurity. We wouldn't even know where these snippets were likely from until nearly a decade later, when Alex1984 reposted the 2010 snippets. Alex claimed the snippets came from, of all places, the selection menu from a bootleg Russian DVD of Jack Le Le Cocon. It was also uncovered that at least the same clip that Alex had posted was also on yet another Russian bootleg. This bootleg was discovered to be an entire DVD series that compiled various animated movies and shows, its title roughly translating as Cartoon Party. This supposed DVD series would become a crucial part of the search for how long it would take, and what we'll touch more on in just a moment. Thank you. Finally, by June 2023, the song had made its way to YouTube, where YouTuber Visual Confusion combined both known clips of the song into one video. After this, people at last began to take interest in finding the song. What I actually think helped pique interest in the search after all this time was this picture of an abandoned teddy bear on the beach included with Visual Confusion's video. It matched the calm and lonely vibe of the song very well, and quickly became associated with the song itself. Okay, so back to Cartoon Party. By November of 2023, HD recordings of the menus for Cartoon Party 3 and 4 appeared. Currently though, only the DVD menus from Cartoon Party 3 and 4 are available, and both only include short looping parts of the supposedly 4 song. There is evidence 
evidence suggesting that at least 14 editions of Cartoon Party exist. The current theory is that at least a few of these editions include different unheard snippets of the song. As such, many on the dedicated subreddit for how long will it take are trying to locate these lost editions. Whether these editions really do include at least some different parts of the song or just what we've already heard though remains to be seen. Now, the question you're probably asking right now is why the song seems to only appear on Russian bootleg DVDs. Well, there isn't a clear answer to that, but the current idea is how long will it take was likely the first resort on some royalty-free website, and whatever free sample available of the song was simply ripped and put on all these bootleg DVDs. If true, then that means this song is just sitting on some royalty free website somewhere and just no one's found it yet. Personally, I think the song is one of the most likely to be found, as people are uncovering new information on the dedicated subreddit for it almost daily. And I think how long will it take serves as a testament for how quickly searches for lost things can ramp up, even so long after the fact. I very much doubt the people putting the song on their DVDs would have ever thought so many people would even care about it. But Hopefully soon, the teddy bear will no longer have to ask how long it will take. Okay, so I'm recording this a few days after what you've already heard. Do you remember how I said this was the most likely to be found? Well, it appears I was right. Just one day at the time of this recording, Reddit user The Arabara announced they had found the first song, which is now available on YouTube. And the way they did this was extremely clever and complicated, using the Cartoon Party DVDs as the basis for their search. A month prior, it was discovered discovered that Cartoon Party 4 was supposedly created by the company AOS Studio, and the only mention of them online being they had dubbed some Bollywood movies. The Arabara found one of these Russian dubbers had a portfolio showing the DVD menus they had worked on and created. One of these was for the movie Moving Malcolm, and the credits for this movie, the songs used were copyrighted by Soken, a performing rights organization in Canada. Deciding it was worth a look, the Arabara then searched Sokin's website for how long will it take, and buried within the site, they found a song with its title by Paula Toledo. Further searching this name, they found this Reddit post from over a year ago that talked about Toledo's song, which included a full version that was found in a podcast. And just like that, nearly 17 years later, it was found. And what a way to find it. After the fact, people also uncovered How Long Will It Take, its true title being simply How Long, had been used as credits for the 2005 Hallmark movie Secret Lives. So not only was the artist's name for the sought after piece already on Reddit for over a year, but the song was already on YouTube for three. It makes you wonder how much assumed lost media is on YouTube right now, but they're simply not seen or seen by people that don't know it's lost. But regardless, the hard work of people like the Arabara finally solved its search, and what a great moment it was to see how long will it takes subreddit be able to celebrate with a job well done. So before I say anything else, I am a massive fan of Vocaloid. So forgive me if I nerd out a bit here. Vocaloid, in the simplest terms I can think of, is a program that makes virtual singers. Musicians use a program called Vocaloid to type in their desired melody and lyrics, and then Vocaloid will sync it for them. They can use different voice banks and adjust the pitch to have this voice sing the way they want it to. These 
these voices are usually from special recorded pieces of actual singers and represented with a character drawn in an anime or anime adjacent style. The most famous including Keito, Rin, and Le Kagamine, and of course, Hatsune Miku. Okay, hopefully you're still with me here. Since its rise in popularity in 2007, Vocaloid became something of a phenomenon. From the countless songs made using Vocaloid, to popular Vocaloid artists, to even fandoms surrounding Vocaloid characters and their voice banks, Vocaloid developed its own fan base and culture that is still popular to this day. Currently, one of the most popular Vocaloid artists goes by Massa Works Design, and their songs are usually known for having extremely dark and disturbing themes. One of their most popular songs, The Fox's Wedding, has just shy of 10 million views on YouTube. But before 2012 and their popularity, Massa Works Design went under the alias L and first started posting their works in 2011. However, due to allegedly being embarrassed by these early works, many of their original uploads have been deleted. And since Massa was largely unknown at this point, many of these works appear to have not been saved by other users. These lost songs include Medical Wedding, Crystal Diva 1, Two Winkle Star, Don't Say Goodbye, and Interface. Of these, we'll focus on Interface, simply because it's one of the most popular lost songs known within the Vocaloid community. Currently, only a 10 second clip and a short description from Masa that appeared below Interface's video have ever been recovered, only giving us a glimpse of what the song was like. We'll take a quick listen to it here. According to the description on the landing page that includes the now inaccessible video, this was Masa's second ever work and was created to celebrate Miku Day, a holiday within the Vocaloid community. This day is celebrated on March 9th due to how one way to pronounce 39 in Japanese sounds a lot like Miku. This follows a similar play on words of why Star Wars fans celebrate May the 4th. But I digress. Just a month after its original upload, the video suddenly vanished. Massa has allegedly gone on record to state they don't even remember making the song, and they lost all the original files from this time period when switching computers. This means that if this song has any chance of being recovered, it will have to come from someone who just happened to download the song within that month time frame. Within the past year, others have given in their own takes on what the song sounded like and recreated the video in their own styles. In a sort of ironic twist, Interface has become more well known being deleted than had it been simply left up and allowed to fade into obscurity as part of a producer's early career. Interface also serves as an interesting example of, unless someone really did download it, a piece of lost media is simply gone forever. With effect no chance of even knowing exactly how it sounded. As Interface, along with the other aforementioned masterworks, only had a few hundred views at the time of their deletions, it's very possible those few people will forever be the only ones to hear these songs. Whether that truly is the fate of Interface though, remains to be seen. La Canción de Alicia, or Alicia's Song, is a name given to a short video posted to the Los Media Perdidos Posting Facebook page, a Spanish-speaking community focused on finding lost media. On July 5th, 2021, a user named Hito Mate Triste posted this song that included assorted Alice in Wonderland clips with psychedelic edits, which user Black said then reposted to YouTube a day later and and would spark a wide search for Alicia's song. This included imagery from Triste's post is what earned the song its nickname, and what we'll give a quick watch to here. Yeah. 
So the information after this point gets surprisingly muddy and complex. Before I continue, I would like to give a big thank you to YouTuber Nate for their video on Alicia's song, as that provided the foundation for my own research here. Shortly after Triste's post became popular, people soon discovered that most, if not all, of the Alice in Wonderland edits seen in the original posts were not original, as in they had been taken from various sources. For example, this collection of Alice in Wonderland edits uploaded in 2019 features clips found in Triste's post. However, whether Triste themselves took these edits to make the video shown or the video was already made from wherever Triste found Alicia's song is unclear, as their account was terminated shortly after for unknown reasons. As such, no one could even ask where they had gotten the song or the video from in the first place. Due to the singer's accent and the song first surfacing on a Spanish-speaking Facebook forum, many assumed the singer's accent to be from a Spanish-speaking country, particularly one from Chile or Argentina. By 2022, the YouTube channel Bandas de Chile, who posted videos of different Chilean bands, was identified as a place to come over lesser-known Chilean bands that could have possibly made Alicia's song. While the song itself was not found on the channel, a band with a similar sounding lead vocal, Gin and Tonic, was seen as the best lead. How exactly similar Gin and Tonic sounds to the singer of Alicia's song though is up to your interpretation. Take a listen. Possibly wanting to help the search, YouTuber Yo 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 claimed to have shared a studio with Gin and Tonic and posted the band's for debut album, Free as the Sun. However, Alicia's song was nowhere to be found on it. Yo Yo did, though, appear to have gotten in touch with Gin and Tonic's former lead singer, Ricardo Mendez, to see if they really were the singer of Alicia's song. And the answer was, well, very weird. But here it is. A lot of the wikis detailing the song say that it's confirmed Mendez is not the original singer, but that's not necessarily true. According to Yo-Yo, Mendez first claimed to not even know who the band Gin and Tonic was, despite evidence that he was their lead singer, and denied authorship of the song. However, Mendez also wrote he was going to make a, quote, new 2.0 version of the song, despite apparently not making a 1.0 version in the first place. But on Halloween 2021, Richard Vox, Mendes' then new YouTube channel, uploaded this video, titling Alicia's song as Under the Stars. Even now, there's still a lot of debate whether Richard Vox is indeed the original single or simply made his own version inspired by the original. And judging by the comments on his video, a lot of people are confused on that too. As far as I can tell, Mendez has never definitively stated whether he was or wasn't the original singer, simply posting under the stars with little other comment. And while Richard Vox's voice does sound similar to the original voice, it's not an exact match. YouTuber Nate, who's also also tried to dive into the mystery of Alicia's song and is a musician himself, noted Mendes and the original voice sing in different voice classes. Particularly, Mendes is a tenure, while the original voice is likely of the lower baritone class. So, according to Nate, it wouldn't make sense for Mendes' voice to have aged to a higher voice class when it should be the other way around. However, many still do infer that Mendes was indeed the original singer, but wants to distance himself
himself from gin and tonic due to the bad breakup he had with the band, which was highlighted in this blog post by him. This would explain why he denied knowing gin and tonic altogether, as well as his cryptic way of answering if he was the original singer. Even with Richard Vox's video, the search is still considered ongoing. Whether there'll ever be definitive proof of who Alicia's song belongs to, either by Mendez or someone else, will have to be seen. This one is easily the most popular lost song search out there right now, but also the most infuriating. On October 7th, 2021, user Car92 would post a grainy 17 second sound clip with just this short description, claiming to have it come from the mid 1980s. Due to the quality and the singer's accent, there's a lot of debate on what the lyrics of this sample actually are especially with the first line, but here's what they sound like to me. Again, there's a lot of debate on these lyrics, with some claiming to hear almost completely different things from others. Kara 92's further comments about the song were scarce, only further saying that the file the clip was found on was dated to 1999, and the song being from the mid 80s was only an assumption. Beyond that, Kara 92 couldn't provide much else, and by December 4th of the same year, year, Car92 would stop responding altogether, leaving those who wanted to hear more to search for the song themselves. To help narrow down the search, people tried to find the song's country of origin. As Car92 stated that he's from Spain, most people naturally thought it had to be from there. However, Car92 dismissed the idea, noting that English-speaking bands in the country were rare. Regardless, people attempted to go through available Spanish media from the 80s and 90s, but this has not appeared to bring anything substantial. People then tried to find its origin by the singer's accent. Due to the phonetic pronunciation, many believed the singer to be Japanese. In some Japanese genres, like city pop and J-pop, they will sometimes use English words or phrases. So, many assumed assumed that this could have been from one of those genres, and what we hear is the English portion of one of those songs. However, this was all purely speculation, and currently, no one has found this supposed Japanese song. What actually did help tone down the search was, of all things, the sample's pilot tone. A pilot tone is essentially the frequency an audio travels through to get to a device. Niski on Car 92 post noted that the recording contained a special pilot tone that was only heard with a certain encoding method called MTS. During its lifespan, MTS was only adopted by a few select countries, those being Chile, Colombia, Taiwan, Philippines, Japan, Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and the United States. This means the song, or at least where the song was heard to make the recording, very likely came from one of these countries. While this does help support the idea of the song being from Japan, it doesn't necessarily make things easier. In fact, now there are also a bunch of other countries that this sample could have possibly come from. To make matters worse, we don't even know what type of media this came from. Having to comb through tens of thousands of TV shows and movies from the 80s and 90s from all these 
these countries would already be a massive undertaking. But with the possibility of this simply being a TV commercial jingle, it would expand the search to millions of possible commercials to look through. And that's all implying the original source for the song is even available at all, and not simply lost as an obscure piece of media no one cared to archive at the time. If true, a being from a commercial that would explain why not a single second more of the sample has been found, because more simply doesn't exist. But despite near impossible odds, people are still looking for any possible leads or hints to find more of the sample or the sample's origins, which has only snowballed more and more intrigue for over two years now. Everyone knows that, sometimes also called ulterior motives, due to some speculating that would actually be more likely the song's title, and also just sounding cooler, has taken a life of its own, from dedicated subreddits, to fan recreations, to even animations for it, everyone knows that has become probably more popular than it otherwise would have been if normally released. It's also become associated with this weird purple jukebox, probably because it matches the 80s and 90s aesthetic of the song. Currently in the search, people are trying to identify the song's singer. The most popular leads include the band Off Course, the singer Roxette, or the band Savage Garden. Due to some of their songs either having similar vocals or beats heard and everyone knows that. Of these, Savage Garden, specifically its former singer Darren Hayes, is the one most believed to be the best lead, and that he made everyone knows that as some type of demo. And just to add more fuel to the fire, on November 17th, 2023, Hayes posted a tweet simply stating everyone knows that. Whether this means Hayes is truly the original single and will soon release it, or is just teasing people who think he is, remains to be seen. Personally, after hearing Hayes' voice and everyone knows that back to back, I don't believe it's him. While their voices are very similar, almost to the point of being uncanny, their actual enunciations are not. As we heard, the singer of Everyone Knows That does not sound like a native English speaker. I personally noticed that they appear to drop the S at the end of many of their words, especially when singing lies and motives. But Hayes is a native English speaker, so it wouldn't really make sense for him to do that. Not to mention, if it really was some type of demo from Hayes, there would be no seeable connection to how Carl 92 even got it in the first place. Finally, I do want to touch up on the idea that the sample itself is fake. Some speculate that Car 92 made the sample themselves or used AI, and everyone is just being led on a wild goose chase. But personally, I do believe this is a legitimate piece, partly because people have been able to locate the instruments used in the song. For example, YouTuber Music music fanatic found that the drums heard in Everyone Knows That appear to be from the Lin Drum LMN2 kit, which was primarily used from 1982 to 1985. Therefore, this would mean Car 92 would have had to use historically accurate instruments to make the sample, which sounds like a lot of effort for a hoax they really didn't get any benefit from. Also, people have tried to to extend Car 92's sample using AI, and it just doesn't sound good. And if it's difficult for 2023 AI to pull it off, it almost certainly would be even harder with 2021 AI. What really is the truth of everyone knows that though, may never be truly known.
for our last song, this one is definitely the odd one out on our list, but I think it's easily the saddest. In early 2022, a Reddit user on the r slash music forum made a post with this title. I'm dying. As my last mission, I will be hunting down and saving as much music from obscurity as possible, but there is one song I want more than the rest. In this post, Glittering writes about having very little time left to live, which has left them reflecting on their own life and accomplishments. As their dying wish, Glittering wanted to, as they said, make the words a little better or more interesting. For them, this meant cataloging obscure songs. As part of this mission, they wanted to find a song they had heard years ago on the radio and to hear it one last time before they passed away. They were not able to provide a sample of the song but could provide where and when they heard it. This supposed song was heard on the Northern Texas station KXD Denton somewhere between 9 to 11 in the morning and someday between February 9th, 2018 and February 14th. 2018. Glittering also tried to recall the exact lyrics and even provided a sample of them singing them, which can be heard here. To try for anything, I couldn't stomach things. It just kept getting worse. Though this post gained a lot of traction, with hundreds of people providing their own guesses, it appears none of these were the song Glittering was truly looking for. In their further updates, Glittering wrote that they actually did get in contact with KXT. However, KXT had already changed their playlist by this point and could no longer provide their old one. KXT did have an archive available of the songs played over the years but it appears Glittering was not able to find what they were looking for. In their last update, Glittering wrote that they were still waiting for any further response from KXT. Their last words for their post? Well, I think it will be worth it. Sadly though, it appears no one at KXT ever got back to Glittering. And as Glittering's last update on both YouTube and Reddit were over a year ago, it's very likely that they are no longer with us. It's especially sad to know that not only was Glittering likely never able to find it, but we will never know for sure which song it was posthumously, as Glittering is no longer here to confirm it. As one last tidbit, a song was found that had almost the exact lyrics to what Glittering sang in their sample, this being Jordan that was Savage by Wimple. However, Glittering explicitly noted in their post that it's not this song so it's still up for debate. A lot of people speculate that it really was indeed that song and Glittering had simply misremembered. But others do think that the true song has simply not been found and is still out there. I think Glittering's tale serves as a morbid and bittersweet example of how much music impacts and stays with people. That someone would want to spend the last months of their lives trying to find something they only heard just just once, just so they can listen to it one last time. Maybe that's the reason all these other songs on our list have such dedicated searches, because music is just that important to us. And on a personal note, I hope Glittering somehow, somewhere, was able to hear this song again, somehow.